Hi, in this section, we will talk about how we're delivering a unified cloud experience in VCF, specifically focusing on the infrastructure for Kubernetes and modern workloads. At the heart of the unified cloud experience lies vSphere Supervisor, our embedded declarative API, which allows our customers to deploy virtual machines, Kubernetes clusters, or any other resources using a unified set of management tools on a single platform and using a single API. On enablement, we provide our customers with a set of core supervisor services. For example, VKS, our vSphere Kubernetes service to allow them to deploy Kubernetes clusters or VM service, allowing them to deploy virtual machines, but also other services such as network service to allow them to deploy, for example, load balancers on demand or storage service to allow them to create persistent volumes on demand. But the whole idea of supervisors to create this extensible ecosystem where we can introduce new supervisor services. So if our customers, for example, want to provide additional functionality to their workloads, like an image registry, they can deploy Harp. Uh, but it also allows us to create new functionality and new services and introduce this into this platform, but most importantly, maintaining the same consumption experience because all of them will be managed using the same declarative API. This also helps us to do abstraction of the underlying infrastructure and really allowing our consumers to only focus on deploying workloads, which is what is most important to them. In order to allow our customers to deploy these consumption ready environments at scale, we have simplified the supervisor enablement even more and now introduce a section during the workload domain creation flow where our customers can enable supervisor with minimal inputs. Later on, they can just select the VPC they want to consume and the NSX project and um, create supervisor while they're creating their workload domain. Once we enable supervisor, let's talk about it in a bit more detail of what it actually is. So I have mentioned vSphere Supervisor is a declarative API. Well, this declarative API is Kubernetes based. And what it allows us to do is to define our resources using desired state. So our customers can now focus on what they need and not necessarily how to get there. So for example, whether they're deploying Kubernetes clusters using VKS or virtual machines using VM service, or any of those other functionalities and services, they will be defining the resources using a desired state in a YAML manifest and deploying that to the platform. And the declarative API will make sure that all of these requests get reconciled and all of these workloads get created. The supervisor services themselves come also with additional advantages because not only are we able to add new functionality to the platform, we can do this independently because they have their independent lifecycle management. So we can add services, update services, and remove them without affecting anything else on the platform. Once we enable vSphere Supervisor and we start deploying workloads, these get deployed into vSphere namespaces. And vSphere namespaces are these resource envelopes that you can think of as resource pools, for example, where we configure and assign compute resources, maybe set some quotas and limits, but then also do some further configuration that comes from that Kubernetes side. And that's configuring policies, for example, for storage, or maybe uh, defining which content libraries are associated with these namespaces and defining which images can be deployed in this space. And to provide further isolation of our workloads, we can now integrate our namespaces with VPCs to provide a true network isolation. This then allows our DevOps admins um, to either select an existing VPC when creating a new namespace 
or create their own as well and deploy their resources in a truly isolated way, for example, with private networking without affecting any other workloads on the platform. So let's briefly talk about those specific services, starting with vSphere Kubernetes Service or VKS. I didn't mention it allows us to deploy Kubernetes clusters. But the important thing here is that these are fully conformant Kubernetes clusters that you can deploy on demand in a matter of minutes. We also deliver VKS as that supervisor service, benefiting from that independent lifecycle. So what we are able to do now is to release new versions of VKS that come with maybe new versions of Kubernetes or allowing some new capabilities and let our customers independently update the supervisor service to unlock this functionality without having to update vCenter or anything else. With the latest release, for example, right now, 3.3, we support Kubernetes version 132 and also uh, some additional improvements, for example, with auto-scaling being able to scale down to and from zero for work nodes. All of our clusters are bootstrapped with cluster API. And when it comes to the actual images, these are called vSphere Kubernetes releases, we deliver them and distribute them using a subscribed content library that we create automatically on creation of a supervisor. We distribute Photon OS and Ubuntu images, but our customers have the possibility to deploy win and create Windows-based images if they do have some Windows containers that they want to deploy. And again, the main idea of VKS is to provide a Kubernetes service that is so easy to deploy and extremely scalable. So our customers can decide what kind of clusters they want to deploy, whether they want to deploy many small clusters or maybe fewer or larger ones, or if they want to separate their clusters using different versions for their app testing, or if we're talking about app development, maybe they want to have different stages of Kubernetes clusters, so creating some testing environment, some staging, and some production. When it comes to virtual machines, we can deploy virtual machines as we were able to do for a long time. However, that doesn't mean that we can't modernize the way we really manage uh, our virtual machines. So with VM service, we can utilize that same declarative API and the same benefits and principles and apply to virtual machines. So we will now define our virtual machine's desired state in a resource manifest and apply that to the system and making sure that it will reconcile the request and make sure the lifecycle management is handled by the platform. We can either deploy our virtual machines from OVF or ISO. And when it comes to resource uh, defining for these virtual machines, we use a concept of VM class. And this is something that de defines the hardware resources of the virtual machine, um, including memory and CPU and uh, any reservations, but also allowing us to add additional devices like PCI devices to the virtual machine. For example, if you want to add GPUs for any AI ML workloads, you would create uh, VM classes for that. We do offer 16 VM classes out of the box. These come either in best effort or guaranteed mode, depending on the reservations. But again, our customers can create custom VM classes as well. So you can think of this as that kind of t-shirt sizing for virtual machines, which is very common in the cloud experience world. And the last kind of group I talked about was this ability to add additional supervisor services onto the platform to provide further capabilities and manage these independently from the platform. And one of the new ones, for example, we are introducing is Secret Store that allows our VI admins and our DevOps engineers to create and manage and access secrets uh, from a centralized store. Um, they can also use the CLI or the user interface to create and manage these secrets as well, and then inject them into their workloads, whether there's that's virtual machines or Kubernetes clusters or vSphere pods. So all of these are encrypted by default and really secure, and it really simplifies the 
not only the management of secrets, but also providing that security of scoped access to them. And when it comes to capacity with supervisors, especially if we're talking about these larger environments, we have introduced the capability or the possibility to isolate the management and the workload zone of the supervisor. So under management, when you first enable this for a supervisor, we deploy something that's called a supervisor control plane, which acts as the management function of supervisor. Um, and this zone where we deploy this will automatically be marked as management zone. However, now we can add additional vSphere zones to the supervisor to provide that further capability for our workloads. And then we can decide whether we want to extend our vSphere namespaces uh, over these zones or if we want to add additional zones to them. So we will be able to add additional vSphere clusters vSphere zones into supervisor without having to deploy the control plane and the management kind of overhead on all of them. And when it comes to permissions specifically in vCenter, because this is a combination of vSphere and this Kubernetes world, the permissions are also defined. Some are vSphere based and some are Kubernetes based. So we have really um, combined and bridged that gap between that vSphere and Kubernetes world with the definition of now vCenter roles. We have also created this and introduced this new supervisor administrator role that allows the VI admins to delegate the supervisor kind of management tasks to platform operators. So they can really empower them to do all of the operations they need to do themselves, whether that's the configuration of vSphere namespaces or updates of supervisor services or updates of the supervisor itself. And talking about the update of supervisor, there's another improvement that we have implemented, and this was to decouple the vSphere supervisor version releases from vCenter as well. So we are able to independently release these and provide additional functionality to our customers. These will be uh, distributed uh, again using our Broadcom CDN um, that the platform admins will be able to provide uh, the updates to the supervisor and perform the update without having to update vCenter itself. This will allow us to give our customers more and more capabilities even faster than before. 